welcome everybody um, to this deep seminar. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Subodh Patil from Leiden University here. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist who works, uh, has a background in, uh, in particle physics yeah. and works on a variety of different topics. Uh, but today he's going to tell us about his work about uh, small world networks uh, with the title It's a Small World. And how complex networks help us understand the world. Thank you, both. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so so my understanding is that um, this is a, a, an audience with a broad range of interests and uh, mixed backgrounds. And um, so I, I prepared a talk uh, precisely with that in mind. Um, there will be some slides with uh, quite a bit of uh, details, uh, hopefully stripped down, but uh, details nevertheless for for uh, the experts in the audience, but do not be overwhelmed by them. I, I aim to actually provide a, a more intuitive uh, understanding uh, of what it is uh, you're about to hear, uh, because at the core, the ideas are, are actually quite simple and, and actually quite intuitive, um, uh, especially if you think about them from the perspective of probability and information theory, which is sort of um, an emphasis that I will stress. So, um, uh, probably you're quite familiar with this idea, but nevertheless, I thought uh, in case you're not, I, I would just provide a, a brief uh, historical overview of this idea that the world is a lot more smaller uh, than we think. And uh, it begins, uh, well, uh, I don't know. So most looking around, um, probably most of you aren't uh, as old as I am. Uh, some of you may be, but I doubt it. Um, uh, so this is Will Smith's breakout movie, uh, uh, I think in 1993. Um, right after, you know, success with Fresh Prince, and it was called Six Degrees of Separation. I don't actually remember the plot line, but the idea is that, you know, any two people on this planet are not actually that far removed from each other in terms of a, a set of connections between any one individual and any other individual. And, uh, of course, the, the title of this movie uh, wasn't pulled out of thin air. Uh, it actually came from um, uh, the work of what well, actually has a far older historical background uh, in fiction uh, by a Hungarian science fiction author. Um, but the origin of it comes from a experiment done by Stanley Milgram uh, in 1967. Uh, Stanley Milgram was a, uh, a social psychologist, um, uh, perhaps more famously known for his famous experiment where um, I think, uh, you know, um, Hannah Arendt cites it as, cites it as well. It's where uh, uh, some people were uh, put in uh, different rooms and asked to ask questions and administer shocks uh, to uh, the subject, uh, but uh, little uh, little known to the subject, sorry, to, to the person taking the test, but little known to the person uh, that the subject was in on the experiment. And um, and uh, if in case you, you should really read it up, uh, the, the, the outcome of this was that people like to obey authority a lot more. The shocks were administered with such an alarmingly high uh, degree that um, um, people really drew the conclusion that we all have some, there's a big tendency for people to uh, adhere to authority more than they want. So this is the, actually probably the thing he's most famous for. Um, um, but um, his experiment in 1967 uh, was uh, um, quite simple. He, he, he sort of set up this challenge where he picked somewhere which he figured would be in the middle of nowhere America, Omaha. Um, and people were sort of told to figure out a way. Uh, so this is back in the day, of course, before the internet. Um, everybody had phone books, these gigantic things where, you know, at most you could sort of look up people in your own uh, area code. And he was instructed to figure out, tell people to figure out um, how to get this letter to a stockbroker in Boston uh, with the instructions that you must forward it to somebody that you are on a first name basis with. And as he did that, uh, there would be little tracer postcards that would track uh, the chain of uh, how these letters went from Omaha to Boston and um, found that there was a, you know, of course, lots didn't make it at all because people don't always follow instructions, but there was, you know, some made it in as short as two hops, some made it roughly around 10, but the median length uh, was five intermediate steps or a median chain length of, of six. 
So, and this is people on a first name basis with each other, right? So it's not, it's not like you can just uh, send it to some random person asking do you a favor. It's, do you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody? And, um, um, and by the way, so, you know, I, I was, um, I was born in India and, um, and uh, back in the eighties, uh, messages actually used to get sent like this before telecommunications were 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 so advanced. Uh, we would call them Nirop in my mother tongue, Marathi. You would tell somebody to go on a train and then deliver a message to someone else and deliver. It actually worked pretty well, um, especially when unfortunate things like people would pass away in your family suddenly. Like you know, by the end of the evening, you got a whole host of people in your house. I got the news. Um, so this is this is a remarkable statement about human social networks, um, and uh, the question is. How does one make sense of this? Um, United States at the time probably had a population of roughly around 230, maybe 200 million. It's a lot of people. Um, you would think on average, any two random people would be separated by far more than six degrees of, of separation. So um, how can one make sense of this? So there's a, a powerful mathematical abstraction that I, I, I presume many of you are familiar with. Uh, I will uh, uh, review it. Nevertheless, because I'm going to um, think about it in a very particular way, um, which is um, the idea of a network, which is really simply a mathematical graph. Uh, and in this case that we're interested in, you know, the dots represent people and links represent, do you know, on a first name basis. Uh, the interesting thing about, um, so, you know, uh, mathematical abstractions is on the one hand, um, they're kind of almost absurd distillations of something far, very, very complex. But um, in physics, we're, we're, we're kind of almost um, spoiled by getting away with uh, by that and, and um, realizing that by stripping systems down to, to what you can, uh, you might consider the barest essentials actually is very, very useful for understanding all sorts of properties about the system. And so uh, the way I like to tell my physicist colleagues who've never been around, um, uh, we've never exposed this idea, is that uh, the idea of a network as a mathematical graph is, uh, if you like, our simple harmonic oscillator. So in physics, everything can be boiled down more or less. It always comes down to the physics of just, you know, particles executing simple harmonic motion. This is a simple harmonic oscillator of any relational system where the where the relations are as important as the, the agents that constitute it. So of course, it could signify individuals and connections between them. It could also signify many other things, such as states of proteins. Um, this is this is represents an undirected graph, so it doesn't matter which way you go, but you can start putting arrows on them and indicate this is you know one protein go to another protein. It could indicate, for instance, words in a language, um, and you know whether they have some etymological common root and so on and so forth. So anything where you can sort of write down little things, whatever they may be, and relations between them are very Certain properties, its relational aspects are very neatly captured by this mathematical abstraction, a graph or a network. So um, this is a realization of a thing. I just draw some dots and I draw some lines. Um, but it also helps to think about these things as somehow um, probabilistic. So a random network is also the next iteration of this abstraction. And the idea is that uh, the dots and the links themselves sort of appear with some probability assignment that maybe you're trying to infer, or maybe someone tells you what it is. So um, this is the arena in which uh, a lot of work has been done over um, uh, many decades, and lots of interesting things have arisen from them. And um, um, a very uh, almost a canonical example of a random network is uh, a very famous uh, Udoshani Gilbert uh, mathematical graph. And the idea is that you just have a fixed number of dots and any link can appear with some probability P. It's as simple as that. And P can go from zero, in which case it's just a completely disconnected graph to one where everything is connected to each other. And already in this very simple uh, prototype, uh, there's a lot uh, there's a lot going on. In fact, uh, there are many, many structures that seem to map onto this very almost com comically naive idea, including cortical structures in the brain. Um, um, you know, um, well, I'll get to an example later. I'll, I'll give you a bunch of examples later, but uh, things like, um, you know, uh, contact networks in, in societies when you're trying to study the model of epidemics. And so this is this is this is the thing that that. Uh, it's sort of like the, the framework in which we're trying to understand 
all of these things. And so why would someone like myself uh, be interested in it? So how, how would a physicist even dare to even think that this is something that they could think about? Because, well, when you really try to think about um, things that appear with certain probabilities, with certain properties, um, that's something that actually, you know, many of us come across in life in, in different ways. So I just want to set up uh, two things. Um, and so by the way, the, the, the mathematical formalism on which this is primarily based on is a theory of random networks um, and assigning different properties to different things like, you know, edges and nodes and directedness and so on and so forth. And, um, and I'm about to give you an explanation, uh, a very simple explanation for why the small world property exists uh, based on some work by uh, uh, two gentlemen, Newland and Watts, a very famous uh, paper where it sort of almost pops out. Uh, but the th but I'm about to sort of step back from that. To the, so the, the, the primary sort of uh, goal of my work is to step back in that and sort of even generalize uh, this phenomenon, try to abstract from it. Um, well, try to understand it from even more uh, general assumptions. So I need to um, 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 get into some details that I'm going to uh, try to explain uh, and in, as intuitively as possible. And one of the things about this sort of small world property is that it can actually be extracted from scaling behavior. And uh, uh, um, physicists really love this. Uh, it's, it goes under the technical rubric of renormalization group. I'm going to explain that in a second. Um, but but um, I just want to sort of set something up um, as, in as conversational a tone as possible. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions that comes to me is not only about setting a probability that you have the two nodes, but the underlying architecture where how the nodes are. So that can be random too. That can be specified. Okay. You can add any structure you like on top of it. And these are all different variants of the same thing. And the property of things you don't depend on the underlying structure. You can, you can, you're free to come up with anything you like, right? So, so for instance, there are, there are these things called network growth models that at every, if you like time step, assign a bunch of different nodes and a different rules for connecting them. So whatever you can think of, you're allowed to play. The rules of the game are pretty open here. So this erdos reni one is a very simple one, which is you just assume there's a fixed number of nodes yeah. and you assign the probability of, you know, a link with probability P. You could decide, hmm, maybe, uh, maybe I'm going to make the link more likely to appear if, if that link appears. So if someone's friends with a friend. But the negative power nodes are distributed. That can also come from random distribution. Also, for that model, it's random distribution. Yeah, by the way, don't don't be this spatial structure that I'm throwing showing you here is is for visual purposes, yeah. right? There's there's no notion of dimension. There's no notion of geometry here, yeah, right? There is this information. You can specify it, yeah, right? And you can make it random. Yeah, so so uh, uh, it is something I'm extremely interested in, in fact, yes. But uh, and for the purpose of my talk, I'm going to just, uh, the, the thing I'm most interested in is introducing more randomness than this simple model, yeah. call it disorder. Um, but uh, uh, indeed, you can, you can completely even specify the, the number of nodes as another thing that you draw from a, a distribution. You're allowed to be as completely general as you like. Right, and the problem scales in complexity as you do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. All of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 it's a vast field, right? And 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 the thing is, and so you can decide to relax some assumptions one way or the other, and so. Um, so, so, so there is, so I'm, so for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to work on an example where there happens to be a fixed architecture, but it's actually super way more interesting to not even do that. I'm happy with the fixed how the role of the structure of the fixed architecture comes into the properties. That well, it depends on the properties, yeah. right. That you want. Right. So, 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 um, I mean, is your question is, do people think about the answer is yes. Right. Okay. So it's not known. Yeah, 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 I mean, no, no, there are lots of things, no, right? I'm, 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 I can only speak about what, I, what I've worked on, right? So one of the things that I've worked on is asking the question of, you know, uh, really introducing all sorts of interesting disorder that people haven't been able to mathematically understand yet and just scaling from there. Um, so indeed, the thing I'm absolutely completely interested in is actually the question, by the way, this is the motivation for, for my getting into this is how does this renormalization thing that I'm going to explain in a second work in very weird, you know, 
how does the notion of dimensionality come in? All of these questions are are things that we like to think about. Yeah. Are you generally looking at just pairwise networks or also hypergraphs with higher hyper edges? You can work you can work on those two. Uh, uh, so 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 you mean uh, hyper in the sense that like the degree number doesn't have to be two or three or four? Or can yeah, you know? that the um, edges connect uh, more than two nodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that's a, so that in this particular case you will find the distribution of those, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not restricting you're not even restricting the number of edges. Uh, sorry, the number of uh, uh, links that can pop out of a node, in the, even in the Erdos Renyi case. No, no, but they are always connecting two nodes, not three. Okay. They don't have to. They can some can be hermits, for instance, even in Erdos Renyi, mm -hmm. right? So, 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 I think what's coming up here is that why didn't you look at this? What about this? What about this? And that, that's exactly the, the 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 vastness of 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 this. Now, um, um, yeah. So, 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 um, yeah. I'm I'm only looking at a well. I haven't gone to what I'm about to show yet, but I'm just sort of setting up the general flavor. This is how does one even think about all of this? So indeed, the architecture, by the way, this is, this is a fixed drawing, right? So I could have pulled these out from a random distribution, in which case, you know, like I, I could decide that the, the number of dots even appearing is drawn from some distribution and then the probability of links appearing from them. And then I could imagine that as a time series and they change. Um, these are all interesting uh, uh, frameworks in which to, to look at these things. So, uh, but I just want to first explain on the simplest version of a of just a fixed network with a fixed number of dots with certain links assigned. How does one understand the small world properly? Um, so, um, um, I want to I want to just sort of first uh, explain what this renormalization idea is. And if you're a physicist, you know it. Uh, but if you're not a physicist, you also know it. Um, um, you, uh, I'm just gonna express it to you in the language of probability theory. So um, in life, many things are the outcome of a draw of some underlying probability distribution function. It's crude, but um, one can imagine that in practice, many things uh, uh, correspond to this. So you have some random variables and you have some probability distribution, uh, some probability assignment to having observed those random variables uh, 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 with, some, with some measure. So if you want to calculate, if you want to ask what is the what is the expected value if I take do a bunch of experiments and I calculate, um, you know, what is some function? So it could be heads or tails. What is or what is or you know what is the probability of getting three heads and four tails? I can sort of any function of my random variables, and I obtain the expectation value by convoluting with respect to a probability distribution function. This is basic probability theory. Um, so uh, in physics, one of the, the, the things that we're, uh, we, we've learned, one of the most powerful tools we have in understanding uh, systems of many degrees of freedom, uh, we call it statistical mechanics. And the idea is that there, the probability distribution function is given by this thing called a Boltzmann weight. You don't need to focus on it. It's just something that takes these numbers and spits back a probability of finding that configuration. Particles can here or here with this velocity. So you can calculate the expected value, could be energy or something, could be um, you know, the net magnetization of something. It could be anything that you could consider as an uh, interesting observable by convoluting with this probability distribution function. Now, in practice, and, 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 and there's a very interesting, so this is, this is um, um, a, uh, it's, okay, maybe I'll use the blackboard here. So there's a very interesting uh, a construction you could come up with, and this can be done for any, uh, random variable. It doesn't have to be a physical system. It could be the probability of finding bits of strings in some character, in some in some archaeological find of some ancient script. You can construct a probability distribution function for it. And the idea is this object called a generative functional uh, is is somehow a master quantity that allows you to construct these expectation values by simply taking derivatives of this. So this, if you like, is a probability measure. This quantity here is simply the, the dot product. So imagine what I mean by this is simply sum over all the random variables, say there's n of them. And so when I take uh, the derivative with respect to this, this external source, I call it this j, and then I set it to zero, I'm basically pulling out factors of this random variable. So it's a, just a neat way of rewriting what this probability distribution function is. Um, I don't need to dwell on that too much other than to state that it's just finessing this probability distribution to give me something I'm interested in. And then an immediate thing pops out, which is um, 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 
well, how do we know it, right? So uh, ordinarily um, in life, we we sort of have a, a, you know, we think we have a, a system where, it, you know, let's say you have some public assignment for something, but you know that has to come from something much more fundamental uh, in, in the theory. So what if somebody just, this, just play, play along this, um, um, this thought experiment with me, what if uh, somebody said that there exists an ultimate probability distribution function that tells you the outcome of any possible experiment you could ever, or any, any observable you could ever come up with? Hypothetically, let's assume it exists. Clearly, it's too much information. Um, if I wanted to figure out what the probability of flipping a, a, a head or a tail on a coin toss here, uh, in, in my hand right here, uh, would be, uh, clearly, I don't need to know what the molecules in that glass is doing or what that person down the street is doing at this very instant. So um, in practice, I can only access some of the things that I, I, I'm interested in, in measuring or, or, or observing, and I can forget about all the others. So how does that look like from the perspective of having this ultimate uh, probability distribution function? Um, well, the idea is, uh, there's, so imagine I have a set of observables, uh, a set of variables, some that I'm interested in, let's call them the whys, and some that I just don't really care about, like you know what that gentleman on the street down there is doing or what an air molecule in Japan is doing. So if I had this ultimate probability distribution function, I would get the same answer by just marginalizing over all the things I can't see, okay? So, so of course, you know, like uh, someone flipping a coin across the street, they have their own probability distribution function. Let me just sum over all the probabilities for that person. It's not, it may or may not affect what I'm doing, but in effect, it's just saying if I have to integrate over a whole bunch of things, I might as well do that in a sequence. Might, might as well integrate over all the things I'm not interested in first, and then what I'm interested in. So at the level of this ultimate probability distribution function, if I just go ahead and do that, I'm gonna end up with another probability distribution function. Uh, let me call it an effective probability distribution function, which is telling me about the things that I'm actually uh, interested in. So um, in, in statistical mechanics, we give, call it the Boltzmann weight. In quantum field theory, we call it the Euclidean effective action, if you like. The idea is stuff you can't see, you just marginalize over. And this is going to be some other function. And understanding how this one function goes to the other is what we call renormalization in physics, but it's really just marginalization, marginalizing over things you don't know. Now, I can give you an example where it gets more interesting. Let's say somehow somebody decides to play a trick on me and put uh, like, I don't know, like I have a magnetized coin, there's a gigantic eight Tesla magnet across the street, and then the person's flipping it on and off with some assigned rule. My coin flip is gonna depend on that. But let's say I can't see them, and I integrate, it is gonna have some influence on my probability distribution function when I average over what that person is doing. So the, 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 the philosophy of averaging over things you don't have access to in physics is a very precise technical term. It's called renormalization. In probability theory, it's called marginalization. And it really boils down to the intuitive idea that uh, on large enough scales, things average out. So um, if you remember uh, those old sort of, you know, before we had LCD screens, uh, these sort of RGB pixels, um, your eye effectively sees a color by giving you three primary colors. And on the larger scales, you just average over the, the sum of all those frequencies to give you the effective uh, color that you, your eye would, would perceive. Um, and um, actually, uh, uh, this is, this is, this I think is intuitive, but it's actually a, a, like a, a high school physics problem. Imagine I had a, a bunch of springs connected and, and each spring has a, its own individual stiffness. Right? So, and, and the stiffness is telling how much does it like to resist being pulled. And now I imagine, ah, oh, there's too many springs. I only really see like, you know, the springs at the ends. Um, what is the effective stiffness of the thing that I have? So um, if the stiffness, what I call kappa here, is, is uh, the resistance to the force that you get from pulling it apart, one can calculate what the effective stiffness is. It's a very simple calculation. We already noticed two things. In the limit where one of these springs, let's say I just look at two of them, in the limit that one of them is infinitely stiff, it might as well have not been there, right? It's like if I have two springs and, and if this one is infinitely stiff, then it's more or less like, you know, it's this, this thing's just going off, right? It's, it's as if I just had the one spring that I had in the first place. So limit kappa two goes to infinity, the effective spring constant is just the spring constant of the thing that I had. Um, if one of them is infinitely slinky, then the, the entire spring is also infinitely slinky. So, so, so this is how you understand that, you know, um, if I had 
something in between that I couldn't see, there is a net renormalized and effective and averaged out spring constant that one can calculate. And this is actually even uh, encapsulated in English idiom, right? A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So it's, renormalization is something that you intuitively know. It's the reason why uh, I know that if I you know, picked up a cup of coffee and put it on this table, I know it's gonna sit there because all the average microscopic physics of, of atoms and nuclei and electron clouds, orbit, it doesn't matter, it averages out. At the end, I see a solid object, it averages out. So that is called technically renormalization. And uh, there's that, and, and um, it's really just trying to sort of infer what is happening at the largest scales um, without knowing the details. And it is a very precise prescription, uh, but in practice, calculating it is very, very hard unless you do it in the simplest possible context. Now it gets actually a lot more interesting when you flip it around and think about it in terms of information theory. Um, so the idea, so one of the strangest things that uh, one notices as a scientist as you pursue your education and you learn different things is sometimes people get away with writing like the simplest, silliest, dumbest models. And you think, surely that can't be true. Life must be more complicated than that. So uh, for those who are interested, I highly recommend this very nice paper. Uh, 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 ben Makhta and, and Jim Setna are, 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 are really sort of pushing this perspective. And I, I've learned a lot from reading their papers. Um, you can actually quantify from the perspective of, of Fisher information, um, uh, or really just the information you get from a certain experiment as to why this has to be true. Um, simple models are true because that's what happens when you average out over small scale details. So um, imagine you had some sort of diffusion process. Okay, so this is a, a diffusion equation. It's telling you how over a certain amount of time you start with a blob or something, how it's going to spread around. And you just watch it do its thing. And then you, then you write down all possible possibilities for, for all how you could possibly describe uh, that evolution. So there's a, a, a drift term, a, a diffusion term, and, and so on and so forth. And what you notice as you start coarse graining, as you start averaging, I'm saying like, okay, I don't, I'm not really interested in the small scale diffusion. I'm interested in slightly longer scale diffusion. And I keep going. You notice that as you keep writing down the equations for the coarse grain degrees of freedom, this number tends to go up. This number tends to stay where it is. And this number also tends to stay where it is, but all these others tend to drop out very quickly. They get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of your effective description. So, um, in particle physics, we call that power counting renormalizability, just counting derivatives. Um, for an information theorist, it's literally telling you that your Fisher information, your information that you would uh, extract from a, a set of stochastic observables uh, really depends on some parameters more than others, right? So so, uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, getting back to this coin flipping, it's going to depend a lot on, you know, the speed of my thumb, but very little on the skin color of my thumb or, you know, what, what, the, what the window is doing over there. So some parameters I can change a lot. The outcome of the experiment will be more or less the same. Some parameters I change a little bit, and there's a massive difference. And um, um, for those, I think many people in this room are probably familiar with a spin system. The idea is imagine you have a bunch of arrows pointing up and down and you and you can arrange them such that they sort of like to have an energy cost of being unaligned. So you keep them, they like to sort of be more or less aligned, but then there's random fluctuation that causes them to do different things. And you write down the most general possible energy function you can, or a thing that describes your dynamics. And you do this for screening. And again, you find some parameters just like to just stay where they are. And some parameters just drop out. And so simple models are true because that's what happens when you average over small scale details. And that's really just the mathematical consequence of locality and causality communicated to long wavelengths. And so um, what this is telling you is that if you try to over model a system or you try to model a system with, with as much detail as possible, uh, why bother? So, so um, here is this is from a former master student. This is a work uh, he did in his thesis was he applied, uh, he looked at the, um, the Fisher information associated with a series of, of trained neural networks trained on the MNIST data set. And uh, you calculate the eigenvalues of the Fisher information and you suddenly notice this massive exponential hierarchy. What does this mean? It means that this, whatever this combination of weights corresponds to this eigenvalue is, if I change it a lot, I'm really gonna mess around with my ability to recognize this seven. But if I started jiggling around these, 
it doesn't make too much of a difference. It's still going to return back uh, a seven. And so there's a there's a one to one map between information, Fisher information, and the concept of of relevance, uh, both colloquially and technically in uh, the normalization sense. So this is this is um, sort of uh, a, a quick sort of crash course on on uh, on why is it that uh, this sort of analysis can be so fruitful when you're looking for things at very very large scales, such as the average distance between any two nodes in a random network. And uh, um, I, so I did this to set up the slightly more technical things that are about to follow. But um, um, this is a very simple understanding in the most silliest case you could think of is, is a concentric ring with uh, k-nearest neighbor links. And, uh, and if you're strictly on a lattice, if you strictly are on something with a very ordered structure, um, you're going to go to the same number of nodes as you hop from one to the other. So you expect on any regular lattice, the average length between any two nodes is going to be proportional to the number of nodes itself. It, you can, it can't be any other way. But now what if I start just putting in random shortcuts? And in fact, let me do that in such a way that every k step, there's about z random shortcuts, just randomly assigned. So if I make k steps, now I got uh, z to the k uh, shortcuts I have access to across the system. So very crudely, if, I, if k is counting the number of hops that I'm making at every step, um, then I obtain this k by just simply taking the log of both sides of this equation. And if k is roughly the number of, of steps I make, you're quickly seeing that the that you're getting a behavior of the average number of steps that goes like log n and not n. And this log n behavior is what we call a small world. It's when you suddenly shave down the size of this thing down to a much more smaller number. So the log of the population of the Earth is roughly, I don't know, eight or nine, right? Even though the, the number is about eight billion, log with uh, natural base uh, e. So this is a very uh, simple system, but um, but this is this is also a very hand wavy argument. So to make it rigorous, uh, Newman and Watts applied uh, what is known as renormalization group reasoning, and um, arrived at an answer very quickly. And it's it's so simple that it, I think it can actually be followed in a few slides. Um, so don't be overwhelmed by this idea of renormalization, but 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 do. Uh, embrace the idea that we'd like to coarse grain this thing and see what happens as we continue coarse graining. So roughly, if I start just sticking shortcuts into this into this ring, um, if the average number of shortcuts is really, really tiny, average meaning the number of shortcuts per, per site is really tiny, I'm going to have the lattice behavior. It's going to scale again. Uh, if it starts to get big, then just from that back of the envelope argument, I know it has to scale like log n. So there has to be something in between where something happens. Um, what is that uh, magic in between? So, uh, so for at a fixed probability of uh, assigning some shortcuts, there must be some critical number of nodes, or, or vice versa, fixing the number of nodes for some critical probability, uh, something magic happens. So let me let me just associate a scale with that. See, it's dimensionless. Um, how do you understand how that works? So you know it has to depend on p. Why don't we allow it to depend on p? via some power. And uh, you know then that if I try to look at what the average length would be between any two nodes, it has to go like this function, where n is the number of nodes, where this function goes to a constant where this number is tiny, which is just the lattice behavior, and it has to go like log x divided by x, uh, such that I can basically recover the fact that it looks like log n once this probability becomes bigger. So this is just sort of putting together our intuition into, into an equation. So now why don't we actually do this for normalization group transformation? I'm just going to block off nodes in pairs of twos and see what happens. So as I block off nodes in pairs of twos, um, well, the number of sites goes down by a factor of two, but the number of shortcuts doesn't get changed at all. So the probability of those number of shortcuts goes up by a uh, factor of two. And of course, the average length has to, has to shrink by a half. So if we stick that into our, our equation and we enforce that, uh, that, that this is the scaling relation that we have to have, right? So we can rewrite this as this relation and then we demand uh, that, you know, once you do a coarse graining, the average length goes down by half, probably goes up by two, 
that this the number of nodes goes down by half, that this exponent is oops. Uh how do I make it big? Okay. So this exponent is one. And it and it followed from this really cartoon scaling argument. So um so this is what in uh, condensed matter physics is known as the percolation transition. Mathematicians know it uh, by, by some other name. Um, but the idea is that once you have uh, more than, a, this, and by the way, N could be massive, so this critical probability has to be very, it's saying on average there's one shortcut uh, per, per network. And that is how in the system, yes? So, so the the argument, so the, the yeah, so the original Neiman watch does the rewiring, right? I'm really just thinking about just adding, so I can keep it simple. Yeah, yeah but you're right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so this is an understanding of this behavior when you have this underlying lattice structure. Um, and uh, it's 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 worth going into just seeing whether this is actually realized in reality so this is the so i'm a high energy physicist uh, so is, so is jay we sit in the audience um and we are a very small uh world on average any two uh authors who publish in in a hep th on the archive are separated by at most five uh collaborators um um it's not an it's not an accident that the concept of erdos number actually comes from uh, uh from this as well uh because he worked with lots of people um, here is some data. This is actually very outdated. Um, this is from 2007, when face back when Facebook only had 700 million users. Um, this is the median length between any two Facebook users, and it's about uh, 4.7. Um, so this is uh, so it's it's not all communities. The Netherlands isn't here, for example. Um, but uh, but this is showing. So so the colors are to are to emphasize the number of strengths, uh, uh, the strength of the number of connections between any two countries. So already we're starting to see uh, some sort of a linguistic block here. So this is, of course, the Hispanic Mexican, uh, sorry, the Spanish speaking world. Uh, for some reason, this is actually very interesting to me, Southeast Asia seems to also form a nice block. Uh, I don't really know what someone in Hong Kong and uh, uh, Malaysia may have in common, but nevertheless, they uh, communicate a lot. And, uh, and you can find these different linguistic communities. Uh, something that I find very interesting is Canadians really, really talk to everybody. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, so, so maybe because, you know, they have lots of immigrants, so they're friendly people. I mean, I think it, it's actually both. Um, um, but nevertheless, this is the median pack length found. It's 4.7. By the way, now there's data that was now 2.2 billion, and it's still about, it hasn't changed much from 4.7. So, in fact, uh, it's, it's five degrees of separation on the Facebook uh, network. It's tiny. It's really staggering. Um, um, and, uh, do I, oh, I missed this slide. Okay. I, I missed a slide. So, so you can actually look up, let me actually see if I can find it because it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, I just want to show you what it looks like for other networks. Um, is it, maybe it's in this one. I had that slide. I somehow got deleted. Um, I want to show you a table for what it looks like. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh this is from a review article. Um you could look up for various different networks. Uh, movie actors have, uh, uh, this is from IMDB, uh, have a average uh, separation of, of three. Um, let's see, the, the, uh, uh, the, where is it? Oh yeah, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the map. So, so the, the, the nematode worm is that it's a neural network complete map that's about that's about uh, three, and and by the way, sorry, I should I should say, movie actually about um, uh, three point six five, and it's compared to what a completely random Erdős-Rényi like network would have assigned for that average length. It's very reassuring if we look up the power grid. The power grid has a uh, has a mean path length of about eighteen point seven relative to a completely random graph of uh, twelve point one, which is reassuring because you don't want your power grid to be a spaghetti bowl. Um, it shouldn't be completely random. 
So, so these, this log n scaling um, um, seems to be uh, appearing where you want it to appear. Um, so, okay. So, um, okay. So, so this, so I just want to stress that. So, this argument, by the way, was made uh, in a very contrived setting, right? There was an underlying lattice. Um, um, what if you start messing around with actually assigning links with different probabilities, or even messing around with the underlying geometry as well? Um, and so, how does one understand it in that context? And so, um, the stuff I'm about to uh, present, um, I guess it's going to get a bit technical. Or something, and I have about maybe 10 minutes that I'd like to just talk more. I'm just going to maybe breeze through uh, the details, uh, but I'm happy to talk about them separately if you like. Is just going back to uh, that picture I had at the beginning is that if you have anything that's a random uh, um, phenomenon drawn from some underlying statistical distribution, then I can derive all of its properties by some unknown or given probability measure. And the thing about these random graphs, these networks, is that all of their properties can be extracted from this thing called an adjacency matrix. So I'm sure everybody knows what they are, but I'm just going to write them down for in case someone doesn't. So if you have a uh, couple of nodes and, and this is node one, node two, node three, node four. If a link appears between node one and two, there's zero going diagonally, you put a one there. Probably the network. The link between one and three, you put a, a, a one there. If there's no link, then you put a zero there, and so on and so forth. This object, known as the adjacency matrix, is, if you like, the thing that contains all the information that you may want to extract from a graph. So by by calculating functions of that object and taking its expectation value with respect to whatever probability distribution you have is in principle uh, what you would do if you're someone like myself. And so um, you can set up the same thing uh, corresponding to a generating function for this object, meaning that I just take derivatives with respect to some external variable. If I know this function, I know everything I want from this graph. I can pull out the power of any element of that matrix arbitrarily. Um, and if you construct this object for this Erdos-Renyi Gilbert graph, it looks exactly like the gas of a bunch of non-interacting free fermions. Uh, if you're a physicist, it just means something can appear or not appear with some probability. That's it. And that actually has a very nice analog in, uh, for physicists, because of these things called fermions that describe electrons and things, they, they don't like to be in the same state at once. So either one exists or none. That's it. So this is this work uh, pioneered by Park and Newman uh, set up this field of the what, what we call the statistical mechanics of random networks. And um, um, the problem here is um, that's nice. It's all very conceptually pleasing, but when you really try to get to calculating things that are of interest, you quickly run into difficulties as one does in a physical system. These things are very hard to calculate. Um, and so one of the things, the thing that I'm, I'm, I, I advertise is, the, is what I'm interested in is the average path length between any two nodes. Um, and showing, right? So there's some distance function that you can calculate via these adjacency matrices. Um, so this is telling you the, 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 the shortest path that exists between any two nodes is given uh, by the sum of these entries, so if they're just weighted networks, it's just literally counting the hops. Um, if you were to try to calculate that in terms of this generating function formalism, um, if if you know you really want to sort of you know just move away from you know making these simple case by case basis and you want a complete general formalism, you quickly run into great difficulties. It is very very hard. Okay, so um, um, is there some way to to make your life easier? Um, and so there are uh, techniques, uh, they primarily go by the name of mean field approximation. And uh, mean field approximation means simply that imagine a very complicated system. And I'm interested in um, what is happening to one particular agent. And lots of things are happening, you know, things are fluctuating all over. So imagine, um, you know, let's say I had this coin flip and now, now like, you know, everybody in Amsterdam has a magnet and they're all trying to mess with my, my experiment. But they're all doing it in a very ordered way, uh, or shall we say, with the same probability assignment. Why don't I just average over their influence in terms of a mean average field? So I'm basically taking all their fluctuations and just imposing it as just one thing that's driving uh, the outcome of my experiment. So that is known as a mean field approximation. 
In technical terms, you're neglecting correlations, right? You're just assuming that there's just all the correlations on this one simple thing that you can guess or you assume. And um, uh, what I'm about to present is a, is a novel mean field approach to random networks that does not assume an underlying lattice structure. So to get to your question, you know, what if, what if you have different structures, what if all sorts of disorder, this mean field allows you to do that. Of course, it gets more and more complicated the more and more complicated the underlying uh, geometric architecture gets different. So, uh, and it's really, uh, I will, I will, you know, actually, I don't wanna, I'm happy to talk about the details of this. Uh, I will just, I will just sum up and say that it is, it is possible to do this. And it is actually comes down to just some very simple combinatoric um, that maps very nicely onto the mathematics of, um, of asking if you had a bunch of zeros and ones, what is the probability of having a string of four zeros and five, five, five ones here, such at the beginning and end and one and zero. It's a, don't worry about it. Uh, it took me, this is my pandemic hobby, by the way. It took me about two months to crack this. But, um, but one of the things that you also have to understand about when you make these approximations is what can you not figure out? And one of the things that these mean field things do not get right, and we're actually very reassured that we got the, the correct thing wrong, uh, was the nature of the transition. It looks like a first order phase transition in our mean field, and we know that it isn't. So we're very reassured that we've gotten the right things correct, uh, the right things incorrect. Um, but we also notice that um, 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 we're all, you know, it, it really seems to capture all of these, all of these things that everybody else uh, knows to be true, and it immediately allows us to generalize in a way that I, I will present in this. Can you uh, explain more about the phase transition? Which transition do you look for on speculation? Or... Okay, so so ordinarily, if you see something like this for some order parameter, you're thinking you're getting a first order phase yeah. transition, right? So a percolation transition is not a first order phase transition. Yeah, but which one do you look for now? So what is this? Yeah. yeah, okay, so this is the probability of having, so this this probability P infinity is that there does not exist at all. Uh, like there's exists at least two nodes that are hermits, okay? Um, uh, or one node that's a hermit. There's just one path that just doesn't have an answer. So it's one minus that probability square root is sort of counting, does there exist a giant connected cluster? So we call that, the we call, refer to that as some order parameter and we're just plotting, it's not really an order parameter. Right? And we're plotting it and it looks like we're getting something. There's a probability of having a giant component. One minus that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, having hermits, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 and, and the thing is, the way it looks like is it looks like, so we know this is wrong and we're happy that it's wrong because it's showing us that the mean field should be wrong for this. Um, um, but what we do get is some very interesting. So, so when is the mean field valid is when correlations and fluctuations are negligible. And what we find, oh, and by the way, analytically can prove the small world scaling. It actually pops out. And um, so that's nice. And, uh, and, and the only thing that we're using this to trust is things that actually scale, you know, very close uh, at, at large wavelengths. So we're getting the actual mode. Uh, so this is the results of a simulation versus our, our mean field. Um, and we find exactly what we expect that as we get closer and closer to the quote unquote uh, critical point when the graph sort of fractalizes and turns to different things, our thing gets worse as we like. But there's something else that's very interesting, which is very, very far away. Yeah. Which, which line is the simulation? Which one is oh, the sorry. Yeah. So the simulation is the, uh, simulation is the dash line and this is the mean field. Yeah. So, so it gets worse as you get closer to the critical point. But it also gets better as you get away from the critical point far away too, as you expect. So, so that was nice. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna just get this. Uh, so I'm just gonna put. Uh, so, so, so this mean field, by the way, uh, that that we that we really generalizes to all sorts of things if you have the courage to calculate further. So one of the things you could imagine is that you have some probabilities assigned with some amount and some some nodes assigned with links appearing within their, their community with a different probability and some intermediate links. So you're introducing disorder in terms of how likely these links are to form. So you could, you're could looking at the, uh, a situation where you're artificially asking, could there be different communities and asking what the path length is there. So I would like to stress that this is probably the first analytic uh, uh, thing where you introduce um, some sort of disorder. Uh, and still have something analytic to show for it. And you find actually some very interesting behavior. So I'm gonna skip this. It's, it's, ask me about it later if you want. Sorry, can you say just uh, what's the disorder? 
Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. So okay, so so you have a, so before the order of friendly graph is all probably all links appear with some some probability. Now you're saying there's some set of links, some set of nodes where that probability is some number, some other set of nodes with some other number, and then there's some probability that they can assign from each other. It's a stochastic two-block model. Um, and uh, and and what we find is that actually there are different phases. So this actually this is a lot of mathematics to to prove something that kind of makes sense. It makes common sense is that the small world behavior still persists once you start adding disorder. And by the way, you can make, you can increase the amount of disorder. The combinatorics gets hairier and hairier. Uh, you need to, um, uh, you need to, it just gets very, very, very hairy, but th there, there does exist a formalism. It's got to do with the permutations of uh, N symbols over an, an alphabet. Um, um, and uh, we noticed some very interesting new phases. So one of the things you could do is uh, imagine um, that uh, you can actually have, um, I think this one is probably the most, uh, so you can imagine that you are very far away from the small world space. So, so you know, you, you're basically in the log, uh, in the end scaling for one network, but one of them is in, is in the small world phase. And if you make the connections between them, they can just hop and effectively become like a small world too. So there, there are different phases once you introduce uh, this order. And um, and that's that's for us was actually a so I'm, I'm this is my last slide so that, that that for us was just showing the the power of this very silly mean field approximation that we use that actually allows us to sort of analytically understand the small world scaling with more and more disorder and I think it gets very interesting when you now work uh, the disorder in another way which is you make the weight the the links weighted. So imagine you had uh, you, you give the same probability assignment, but you can also you know make that combination as well. If you like, you can make them probability assignments random, more random, and the link is the link weights more random too. And you're already noticing some very interesting behavior. So this is the average path length uh, between any two nodes. If for some of the links you just give them uh, increased weight, it takes longer to get through them if you like. And and there you notice this very interesting beat structure. Um, and, uh, I think this is, and, 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 um, aside from some convergence issues, the mean field also reproduces this. Um, I still have to finish that up before I can present it to you. So can you tell us the axis? Yeah. So this is the average. So this is, this is a, it's a normalized probability distribution for the average number of paths, right? Between any two links. And I think for this one, you make one of the links 20, the weight is 20 and the others are one. So, the, so, so going over that 20 is just going to take you longer or shorter, depending on how you want to think about it. And this is the average, the, this is the distribution of path lengths between any two nodes in that network. So I, I, I like to think this is traffic in Amsterdam. Uh, imagine a fictitious city with a horseshoe type structure. It's very quick to get around the horseshoe, but then imagine a lot of crowds on the, the few bridges that connect them. You're going to see this structure and the average amount of time it takes to get from point A to point B. Um, this also is a model for um, disordered percolation. I got excited and then I immediately realized that this is just silly and it doesn't work. So like every silly physicist and well, everybody who decides that they don't model. Can you compare that each node of these probabilities is like walking, the first node is walking the first block, the second node across blocks. And, so and you penalize extra for crossing between them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 uh, so uh, for people who think about network uh, epidemiology, I thought that some aspect of this must be at play. And the spread of networks on an uh, on an epidemic because you can imagine, um, um, I mean, when people were, uh, you know, applying these, you know, so all the public information we got from um, the RIDM was based on these sort of compartment based models where they just give you one number for the reproduction number. We know that was a bit crazy, especially I think after like you know, uh, like that whole debacle when everybody with one Janssen shot could go dance and then suddenly you know. 9,000 people got infected and they said the R number was like some crazy number, but that wasn't true. It was very localized to a bunch of people that went out dancing. Um, 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 one of the things you can imagine is imagine you have a very, very uh, hierarchical uh, society with classes that don't really interact with each other. So I was thinking in this context, India or the United Kingdom, where you saw timescales for waves that did not correspond to the timescales you would as associate with uh, susceptibility being an issue again in these compartment model models. Um, could this explain the waves that we saw, which is simply that you know a bunch of people got infected, the working uh, the working class, and then you know slowly, slowly, slowly percolated into another population, then it spread again, and then so on and so forth. Uh, I, I well, I'm happy to inform you because it's very nice when you show something is rubbish. Uh, it, the time scales don't work out, uh, but nevertheless, I do think that there is some element of this that overlays uh, 
uh, the uh, SIR compartment based modeling. Um, and so, and so, and what's nice about this is that, you know, this is something that, you know, you can derive with a pen and paper. You don't need a simulation to do. And you understand qualitatively, uh, you know, what, what's going on. Um, I should also stress, so I'm going to stop here. I should also stress one of the things I'm working on right now is actually um, going back to that uh, first slide that I showed where um, um, the, you know, the, the statement is that why are simple models true? Uh, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is actually to show that um, in some well-defined renormalization group sense, uh, the infrared fixed point of all of these agent-based models is SIR, uh, is, is the silly compartment-based model. If you average out over enough temporal scales, you might as well stick to the silly model because you don't have enough information about all the parameters you need to fix to actually make predictions, even if that's possible for these agent-based models. Um, so it's ongoing work. Um, um, I will just, uh, I will, I will, I will just stop here and uh, uh, take some questions. Uh, I just want to sort of emphasize where, where I am going with this is in collaboration with uh, my colleagues in Leiden is we're actually, uh, and, in, and, in, and in Luca and in Barcelona and in Rome, um, and I'm happy to, you know, um, collaborate with anybody if you're interested in this, because I think it's a very interesting question is how do these scaling properties, how do, so physicists work are very spoiled by working in very ordered, uh, homogeneous settings, um, lattices, right? Or like, you know, just, just things that are the same everywhere. But reality isn't like that. So how do you think about averaging over things? Um, this averaging that you saw that we did in the, in the first example by coarse graining that ring, that is averaging everywhere the same. Right? So that's, a, that's how physics do normalization. But what if that's actually throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Maybe you should just average some parts and not others. Um, um, so the, 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 the application of sort of averaging out and coarse graining to networks, I think, I think many people think has to be completely reworked from the bottom up. And that's the kind of stuff I'm, I'm interested in working on, uh, primarily with an eye on applications to, to the real world and not, not silly uh, games on a page as you saw today. So yeah, thanks for your attention. That's all I wanted to, to tell you about. I have a very basic one. Then you wrote a generating function and you had this exponential of j that is. And my question, I'm just copying the physical theory when you write the function function, you don't have this j. Uh, so what is this character? Oh, in, 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 in quantum field theory, we do. Right. So, so, so we introduce it as a means to pull out observables. So, so, so in, you're right in general. You, 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 that, so this is not a partition function. It's a generating function. So the idea is, uh, let's say I had, uh, let's say I had some uh, partition function that I'm going to describe with this and then into the global configuration variables. And then I have my, my Boltzmann weights, let's say that is a function of all the X's. And then by introducing this object, let me call it, uh, let me just write it out what it is. I say, and let's say I have n variables. Then I know that if I take dz by dj, let's say three, I'm going to pull out an x3 into minus beta h if I then send j equals to zero. It's like the dual parameter in the uh, large situation theory. Yeah. In some schools, right? So if, uh, if you know this, you can take derivatives of this to put any expectation value in zero. It's it's a it's a weird theoretical construction, but it's very yeah. useful. Yeah. Uh, what you can do to flip it around is if you give me any random, so you know there's actually a way to construct quote unquote construct an Antonian for any random thing. It could be, you know, series of. Um, you know, it's a script, and you know, it, you, you can just construct it, and then by adding this thing, by taking derivatives, you can calculate the superior. So that's, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I call it generating function. Yeah, no, 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 but you wrote uh, yeah, no, that's why. Uh, no, it's J, not Z. But it's, well, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's not standard terminology for some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moment, yeah. It's a moment generating function. That's right. This is yeah. like the probability, and yeah. this is like uh, into the minus uh, the moment. So then yeah, it's, so so this is clearly a linguistic cloud. Yeah, so we don't even think twice about it, right? In QFT, that's what we call Z of G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone um, else? Uh, it's a question of an experiment that you showed us on the neural network. Uh, you completed the, you said you completed the, the one of your last students. Yeah, so yeah. You completed the information of the neural network. So, sorry, 
Well, uh, what type of neural network did you use? This is like an RDN. This is a feed forward, uh, feed forward neural network. I don't, I don't remember the precise architecture that he used, but he was, it was really just to, to, to sort of. So this is what we did in end, by the way. He had to leave for for, for grad school. Uh, so, so you have a train network. You then what you, the output you're getting is, you know, associated with the Fisher information, and then you just vary it with respect to when you calculate the eigenvalues, and. Uh, yeah, so you take you take you, you treat the output as a likelihood. You take the logarithm of it and you take a second derivative. It's just that second derivative. Of, well, to calculate the eigenvalues, you take the second derivative with respect to all the parameters, and then you just but the parameters are what so the weights the tra of the train network. Ah, so you take the network as a, a train network of the train network. Yeah, yeah. Right, so it's a train network at this point, right? And so, and then the point is this, right? Is that there's this black box has many numbers in it. Clearly, some are you know you can mess some around, and you're still going to get out of seven, right? But but by the way, it's not these are eigenvalues. So it's some strange combination of things. So so I my project where I didn't finish with them, and by the way, this is actually a hard problem. Is now uh, let me apply the sloppy model analysis to a neural network and say, well, let me just forget about these. Can I reconstruct this network? And then have a cheaper, computationally cheaper, optimized network. Um, it's hard, but it's a it's a strategy for optimization. Um, yeah, I also have a couple of questions. So, um, yeah, your your um, mean field uh, thing. Yeah, went a bit fast for me. To understand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, I didn't explain it at all. Why actually, is yeah. it uh, yeah. so? How is it different from doing something like a Degree based mean field approximation or like more standard kind of thing. What is so? The, so, I, I don't know what that is. I, I don't know what that is, but I will tell you that I will tell you that um, um, what people do with mean field is uh, they sort of imagine. So, the, 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 the examples of mean field I've seen for complex networks involve some underlying lattice structure. And you look at you basically write down a continuum theory and then you do the standard mean field you would do in statistical physics because you have. An effective continuum. Um, yeah. So in, pr in principle, mean field is just a philosophy that just lets you get fluctuations. This doesn't require an underlying lattice structure, right? This is just simply saying, um, if I'm asking the probability of getting from point A to point B, I'm assuming that A squared, the entries of A squared, are independent of A and are independent from AQ, which yeah. is not true, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's that's the mean field here. When so what's what's um... I think what a lot of people also do is um, is that they do mean fields uh, based on the degree distribution of the of the network. So you still have sort of the structure of the degree distribution. It doesn't have to be Poissonian or mm. an understanding or something like that. Yeah. But you uh, assume that there are no degree correlations, so that if your neighbor has degree k, yeah, that's ir that's uh, uh, independent of of your own degree. yeah 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 so that, that makes sense that, that makes that sense is, uh, yeah. and then uh, you can so you're saying that the, they write down a partition function that yeah. that that satisfies those constraints and, and you, you you follow right them so instead of using uh, the um, the adjacency matrix you yeah. just work with p of k yeah degree yeah, uh, thing. yeah the, the, by the way there's no unique mean field right yeah exactly yeah. there's there's many so many so many yeah. so many so I was wondering like what is your uh, approach yeah, so the, the, yeah the, the approach here is we're trying to calculate the, the average pattern. Yeah. So let me just, just, just uh, so you want there to be what is it a probability of, that there is a shortest path of length k? Mm -hmm. that, that means you need to calculate the probability that there isn't a shortest path of length k minus one, mm -hmm. and there exists one of shortest path k. Mm -hmm. So so if you assume that you can and, and if you assume that you can't uh, go backwards. Shortest path means you probably don't refresh your steps. Mm. So you're asking for what is a string of elements of this adjacency matrix such that they're all equal to zero. What is the probability of that? And you end up with this number. But this is but this is this is the mean field because yeah. but really you want to calculate you know what is the probability of the the you know the kth power of the adjacency matrix being zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is which is a very highly correlated thing. And so we're neglecting those correlations with this. Right. So this is the mean field. Right. It's a very silly way to calculate it. But we're recovering the thing that we would like to see, which is a small world behavior with some analytic control. That, that, uh, so, but so it really only relates to that uh, the average computing. The neglecting the correlation. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, the, so exactly right. So, so, so there's some things you can calculate 
you better know which ones they are with mean field. Yeah. Uh, and and we don't we know we're going to get something wrong, right? So in fact, even look no, at the no, look no. at the actual distribution, right? They're, 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 you know, they're not really the same, but you scan the mode. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're not going to be able to use that mean field to do to look at cluster conditions, for instance. So 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 I would I would say this, right? So so I I, I haven't thought about that, but I would say this that um, uh, maybe in the sense that. Depending, so I would the way I would approach me, the mean field philosophy is what is the question I want to answer, and then what is a way to get at it. Yeah. So I would imagine um, cluster coefficients. It might be possible, but it, we probably have to work too hard for it for that. Then maybe what you're suggesting is a, is the shortest shortest path there. Cool. And uh, so, how, last question: uh, How does that? So you talked also a bit about the renormalization. But I didn't quite get how that ties into the mean field. So oh no no okay so so the, so the, there are two different approaches to, to understand scaling properties or unobservable things. Yeah yeah yeah. So um um so that wasn't used in this right. That so that approach would have so 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 uh uh so okay so I should I should have stressed that narrative better right in the sense that here are two different here is one way you could have extracted the mean field but that relied on some sort of an ability to the coarse grain very nicely. Um, what does that look like when you don't have an underlying lattice structure, right? So that Newman Watts argument doesn't really work for this. Uh, I, I say this, and now I'm to, right now I'm actually working on uh, a paper right now with uh, my collaborators, where we actually write down an interacting graph model that is renormalizable because of a mapping to a one D spin chain. If its average coordination number is below a certain thing, and it's really just transcribing things. Um, so uh, in that in that approach, I would expect a normalization argument to pop out again, but it's a different it's a different network randomness. You're now adding peer pressure to it, right? Yeah, okay. And, and it's not like the the, the mean field is some sort of a higher fixed point or something. No, no, no. So so I think I think people mean different things by by mean field, but I think at its core, its operational statements you're neglecting correlations. So and that could look like a number of different things depending on the context. Uh, there are many approximations that would do that for you, right? And I think in the, in the in the case we have under a lattice structure, it really is just sort of writing down a continuum generalization and then looking at an average variable. Okay, cool. So, uh, anybody else? If not, thanks to the speaker again.